Let me just say to begin, there, there are kind of two things that are gonna happen in this talk. I'll try and do them simultaneously. One, which I'll start with, and then we'll be sort of uh, underground, is a very, very general consideration about how one goes about or what one means by defining um, a term that's already in use in the context of a new theory. Uh, and, and this is something that I think a lot is presupposed without a terrible amount of explicit discussion. And so I'm gonna begin with a, 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 a short discussion of that. And then I'm gonna get into this very specific example of what it, what, how one should go about or even what it means how one should go about defining entropy in the context of statistical mechanics. And in particularly in what's come to be known as the Boltzmann tradition, although the history of this is more complicated than the, the names we use seem to suggest. So let me just start. Um, let me just start if I can, there we go. So here's the basic conceptual issues of what one wants from a, a definition. Uh, the first thing to notice is, is of course, Whereas there's an idea that a definition is nothing but some kind of linguistic stipulation, there's also the much older idea that definitions are really what science is mostly about. That is answering the question, what is it? Right? If we go back to, to Plato and Aristotle, the main question you were asking in philosophy generally and, and in any kind of intellectual enterprise is what is it, right? What is justice? What is virtue? Um, what is space? What is time? And so in a sense, one's looking for a definition, but that, but in, in the later uh, modern period and Locke so on made a distinction between nominal and real definitions. And whereas nominal definitions might just be linguistic stipulations, real definitions were supposed to be accounts of what the thing, the, the, the very thing is. And all of that came to sound very spooky to people like Quine and they rejected it, but I think it was really on target. Um, so then if you say, well, what I'm really after is a real definition, not just a nominal definition, not just some stipulation. The question is, what do you even mean by saying you're gonna give the correct one or the right one? Uh, and then this question becomes even worse or, or more interesting when we're in a situation of what's commonly been called reduction. That is where you have one theory that already has some terminology and then a second underlying theory or more fundamental theory or something in, to which this is supposed to reduce. So somehow the same terminology has to be defined in the underlying theory. And so what is the relation between the original term and whatever you produce in the underlying theory? So that's certainly a question uh, one needs to address. And again, often I think in the logical empiricist tradition, you would just say the words bridge principle or something like that um, without all that much investigation into what, what you were trying to do there. Um, so, that's the large setting. Now, the way I'm gonna apply it here is to start with the term entropy, which as we know, was originally introduced in the context of classical thermodynamics. And in, importantly, right there, it, it was not settled what the underlying microphysics was, right? Whether it was even, a, even an atomistic underlying microphysics, it didn't have to be settled what the nature of heat was, right? So you didn't have to accept the kinetic theory of heat in order to do classical thermodynamics. You just had to believe there were quantities like temperature and pressure and volume and so on uh, that could were related to each other in certain ways. And then you could end up defining uh, for an equilibrium state, you could define an entropy, but then, um, 
once you accept the atomic theory and the kinetic theory of heat, then you're going to say, all right, how do I understand all of these concepts that I've been employing in terms of this proposed more fundamental theory? And, and they're all tricky, right? I mean, they're trickier a bit than we tend to think. Uh, the, the one that isn't very, if you just think of the ideal gas law, the one that isn't tricky is volume. That one kind of just goes over without trouble. Pressure is already tricky, right? What, is, what does pressure mean? Um, in, in microphysical terms. Uh, and it's actually a little bit unusual when you start thinking that through, but I won't talk about that. What is temperature? Okay, we might say mean kinetic energy. All right, now you need to bring in a bunch of stuff there. Um, and what is the criterion of having done this correctly or well anyway, whether, whether correct is the right word, have done well or badly. Now, there is, has been floating around in the literature I would say, or at least in the zeitgeist, what I'll call crude functionalism. I'm not, I, I could probably cite some passages from Lewis about this, um, where you say, well, the way you identify the referent of a theoretical term is sort of functionalist, right? And you say, uh, the original theory, in this case where we have two theories, or we have as it were, a naive theory and a sophisticated theory, that in the naive theory, a concept is associated with a functional role. And then you kind of look around in the more detailed theory for something that plays that role or the thing that most nearly plays that role or best plays that role. And these are terms that are, have just been used a lot. Uh, I guess I remember, I think David Albert correctly many years ago said, what the heck does that, you know, what do you mean, plays a role, Othello? I mean, what do you mean plays a role? What, how do you identify the role that a concept plays? Um, and I think that's right. I think a lot of this kind of vague functionalist talk gets thrown around. Um, what's the role of entropy, right? In the case of entropy, one can argue it, it very quickly, and I will, that in a certain sense, nothing in, if you're doing statistical mechanics, uh, plays exactly the role that entropy played in classical thermodynamics. And that's for reversibility reasons, which we'll come to, right? That is, it was supposed to be a law of thermodynamics in the original, that, that the entropy always uh, never decreases, right? And you're just not gonna find anything in the statistical mechanical account that absolutely never decreases. So you might say, well, nothing plays that role. Well, you know, now you get into what you mean. Um, and there's a, yet another problem, which will be more acute by the time we get to the end of this, which is that you might find many things in the underlying theory that are definable, that in a certain sense, equally can sort of equally well play the same role. And if that's true, is there any way to choose between them as to which is the right or correct or better definition? It may seem obvious to you if you're thinking functionally, well, no, of course not. Um, I, I mean, in fact, let me just do anticipate what I'm about to say. Suppose I can define two different quantities uh, in the underlying theory that are, that are, for all practical purposes anyway, coextensive then one might say, well, of course they, then, then they're equally well suited to play the role. However well one plays the role, the other plays the role and there's no choice between them. I, I wanna say that's wrong. And, and somehow the, the main point in this is going to turn on arguing that it's wrong. Um, so let me start with an example to warm this up and then we'll get to entropy. All right, so uh, what is a circle, right? We want a definition of a circle in Euclidean geometry or in, in any other geometry actually. So what's the right definition? Um, and you might say, well, what plays the circle role <laughs> in geometry? I don't even know what that means. Um, but suppose we have two definitions, two conditions, two criteria that are, that are necessarily materially equivalent, right? They pick out exactly the same objects. Uh, then someone, your, your immediate thought might be, well, uh, use either one you want. 
um, how could one be the right definition, the true one or the real one, or give the real essence of circlehood if they're necessarily coextensive? Um, but I, I don't think that's correct. I don't think that's the way we think about things. I don't think that's the way we should think about things. I think among these necessarily coextensive concepts, one may in fact capture the essence of a circle more correctly than the others. Um, and let me just give obvious examples. So here's a definition. A circle is the locus of all points equidistant from a given point which we'll call the center, right? So that's a familiar definition of a circle. Um, a circle is a closed curve with the largest area for a given perimeter, right? Now, everybody can see you know, that in a Euclidean setting, those are materially equivalent, right? You, you, they, those two definitions pick out exactly the same class of objects. But I wanna claim, um, the first one's the right one, right? That's the true definition of a circle. Uh, and, and the second one is what, what the ancients would have called a property, the appropriate, a thing that is, that is a identifying feature of a circle, but it's not its essence. And of course, all this talk of essences sounds kind of spooky, but let me explain what I mean. Um, here's a comment that Aristotle makes that, uh, I think is right on target. Um, although the edge of it, I, I can't quite see, but let me, let me try and read it. So this is from De Anima when he's exactly talking about defining the soul. He's, you know, what is the soul? Uh, and he says, it, it seems not only useful for the discovery of causes of the derived properties of substance to be acquainted with the essential nature of those substances, as in mathematics, it's useful for the understanding of the property of the equality of the interior angles of a triangle to two right angles to know the essential nature of the straight and the curved or the line and the plane, right? If you don't know what those are, you're not gonna understand those proofs. But also conversely, for the knowledge of the essential nature of a substance is largely promoted by an acquaintance with its properties. So you have things like circles and then you find out a bunch about them. And among those properties, all of which may actually identify circles accurately, um, some play a special role. So he says, when we're able to give an account conformable to experience of all or most of the properties of a substance, we shall be in the most favorable position to say something worth saying about the essential nature of that subject. In all demonstration, a definition of the essence is required as a starting point so that definitions which do not enable us to discover the derived properties or which fail to facilitate even a conjecture about them must obviously one and all be dialectical and futile. Um, so what Aristotle is saying is look at, look at these various proposed definitions and see from which you can prove or explain or account for the most of the things you think need to be explained and do it most easily. Now, I gave you two definitions of a circle. Let's just give it a, a quick example, um, right? So here's a fact about circles that if you, if you take any arc like the red arc there, uh, that'll subtend an angle at the center and it'll subtend an angle from any point on the circle, other point on the circle outside the arc. And it's a fact that, that the angle subtended at the center is gonna be twice the angle subtended at any point on the uh, other point on the circumference. So there's an interesting fact about circles, right? And not an obvious fact about circles, kind of a very interesting one. And all I'm asking you is to, to say, suppose we started with a definition of a circle that a circle is closed curve that encloses the greatest area for a given perimeter, right? Start with that definition. And now try and pro prove this, okay? And all I can say is good luck, right? Uh, I, don't, I, I have absolutely no idea how you'd even begin from that feature. It is a perfectly good identifying feature of a circle I have absolutely no idea how you'd go about trying to prove that. 
But if you start with the normal definition of a circle, it's more or less child's play just to, to show you because you draw in this, uh, you draw in these radii and you have uh, three isosceles triangles. And I, it, I won't go through the proof. If you, I mean, I'm gonna post this thing if you wanna look. Just by looking at these isosceles triangles, you get these equalities and you can derive that, uh, that uh, the, the little angle zeta there is half of, of alpha um, by, by, by a few lines of, of, of arithmetic. So clearly that standard definition of a circle plays a central role in the production of proofs. And we think of the proofs as in some sense explanations or accounting for other features of the circle. And some starting points are just gonna be a heck of a lot better than others. I mean, the only way you're ever gonna get there if you start with the circle as the as the, the shape that encloses the maximal area is somehow to derive the normal one and then go from there. So I think this is, I think Aristotle was right on target here. And we ought to be asking when we're, when we're asking, is this a good definition? Well, what can I prove from it? Or what can I explain from it? How easily do the explanations go? All right, now that's the kind of general prologue. Now let's talk about entropy. So entropy, as everybody knows, is, is defined or used, or there are different types of it. I don't know what you wanna say. The word is thrown around a lot, um, having been introduced in classical thermodynamics. And then some specific mathematical definitions of entropy have been proposed. Let me just give you a few of them. And we're gonna play, as I can play this game, which of these is not like the other, okay? So um, in Boltzmann, well, in the H theorem or the Ada theorem, I, now I'm not sure which it is, uh, Boltzmann defines a quantity H, the negative of which is then I, somehow identified with entropy. And there's the definition, right? It's that integral. Um, so that's definition A. There's a, a definition that we call now the Boltzmann entropy, but as I, I learned from Wayne, um, was actually first written down by Planck. And Boltzmann never wrote this formula down. Uh, that S, the same entropy S is K L N W, where the W is originally Wahrscheinlichkeit and is somehow associated with probability, but then later in the tradition, in the tradition I'm going to be talking about, becomes associated with the volume of a, of a region of phase space in natural measure, right, in, in Louisville measure. Um, Gibbs defines an entropy this way as a sum of, uh, again, let's not worry about what the P's are, except that they're in some sense satisfy the mathematical conditions of probabilities, um, negative sum of, of PI ln PI, von Neumann, that thing looks a heck of a lot similar to Gibbs, although the Adas are quite different objects. And then famously Shannon, which mathematically looks exactly like Gibbs, where again, those, the PIs now mean something entirely different. So if you look at those five definitions, you know, one of them kind of just jumps out at you as this is different, okay? This is some entirely different way of, of trying to get at entropy um, because all the others are a, a sum or an integral of, of something log something. Uh, now, the, the definition of entropy, if we go back, so, so we know Boltzmann sort of, gave an argument that he could define something he called entropy and furthermore prove that it would monotonically increase or not decrease anyway, as the classic thermodynamic entropy was supposed to. And having produced that 
proof and made actually rhetorically extremely strong claims about what he had proven, um, some objections were raised. And famously, there was the a reversibility objection. Uh, and that runs, uh, everybody, I guess, is familiar with this, that you have that the microdynamics that he's using, which is Newtonian mechanics applied to point particles, uh, that microdynamics is reversible, which, which means what? It means that if you have any evolution in time allowable by the dynamics from S initial to S final, there exists an operator, um, which is misleadingly called a time reversal operator. It's probably better called a velocity reversal operator or a time derivative reversal operator. Uh, but anyway, all that really matters formally is that there's some operator star such that if, if it's an allowable evolution from SI to SF, then it's an allowable evolution from SF star to SI star, where each of those evolutions is going forward in time, right? In, in each case, the, the, the thing on the left of the arrow is supposed to happen before the thing on the right of the arrow. So you have such an operator. And furthermore, that operator has the property that, it, that it, the entropy of the state is invariant under it, right? So for any state, the entropy of, of, of the star of that state is the same. And so if you have that, and then you claim, I, I guess, okay, so I, I, I have this set up actually as a, a, as a set of inconsistent premises. Originally in classical thermodynamics, you claim the entropy can, can increase, but it cannot decrease. And now claim three is obviously incompatible with one and two, right? Because if the entropy can increase, then there is some evolution from SI to SF where the entropy goes up, but then there's some evolution from SF star to SI, pro, SI star where the entropy goes down because the entropy of the state is the same as that of the star of it. So one, two, and three, just by logic, you can't hold them all, right? They, they, they involve a contradiction. You got to give up on one of them, at least one. And so that's the objection, right? So if Boltzmann says, here's my definition of entropy and the definition you know, has this feature that there's this star operator that leaves it invariant and he claims I can prove that my entropy can increase but not decrease, you say, no, you can't, right? That's, that's impossible given the microdynamics you're working with. Um, and so you got to do something. And what you do, everybody knows, is you give up three, right? Of those, you, you say, all right, I, I, I can't give up the microdynamics. And it's just a fact about the way I've defined the entropy that this star operator leaves it invariant. So I have to give up three. I have to admit that it's physically possible for entropy to decrease, even though classical thermodynamics says it isn't, even though that's a law, right? Second law, that it can't. You say, well, um, I'm going to give up that having law-like status because it, 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 in fact, it can. Now, as far as the actual problem we had, the incompatibility, as far as logic goes, you solve that incompatibility simply by admitting that it's physically possible for entropy to decrease. Right now, you no longer have a problem in logic, um, and if you then ask, well, how how seriously do I have to take this possibility? Right, I have to admit it as physically possible, but but do I have to worry about it? Right, do I have to have to have to stay up at night worrying that all of a sudden entropy is going to go the wrong way in the morning when I try to make my breakfast? And the answer is no. I mean, the, the way that you end up, the amount that you have to concede is so mild that it's completely ignorable, right? It, it's kind of a, a, a purely theoretical or metaphysical con concession rather than a physical one, one might say. 
Um, it's certainly from a practical point of view, you don't care the, the, the way that given how you have to make this concession. Um, and so in, in, in a formal sense, you can hold on to one and two and keep something that's not quite three, which said that entropy decrease is absolutely physically impossible, but you can say in a certain sense, make it as improbable as you like, right? You can, as it were, reduce its likelihood as close to zero as you want, and therefore render that concession uh, as unworrisome as you like. And that still gets you out of the logical problem. And in fact, that's gonna be the situation. And, and I just wanna go through that so everybody understands how that goes. Um, and now, and then I wanna make a, what's gonna be a much more, much more controversial claim that that's the end of it. There's nothing more to the reversibility objection. You get rid of it simply by this extremely, extremely mild concession to the mere physical possibility of entropy decrease. And there isn't another problem that has to be solved. In particular, there isn't a problem that needs to be solved by invoking what's normally called the past hypothesis. Okay, so this is where I'm gonna make a claim that maybe, maybe is now very controversial. I'm gonna claim the past hypothesis doesn't come into this. Whereas in many presentations, you need, you're supposed to need the past hypothesis to solve a residual reversibility problem or retrodictability problem, right? I mean, the normal way it said is, well, I can do fine making predictions without the past hypothesis, but if I make retrodictions in the same way, it gives me terrible retrodictions. So I need the past hypothesis to solve that. I'm gonna go, no, you don't, there's no other, there's no other problem that needs to be solved. Good. Now, I'm going to do all this by a parable, and I mean this quite seriously. I think all of, all of the points I need to make are contained in this parable. Um, so it's going to be a funny little parable, and you might find, why, you know, why am I doing this? I'm not talking about entropy anymore, but you'll see the point. Uh, so you're an architect. Sorry, I started a little too early. You're an architect, and, and one day, in your office, Zeus appears. Um, the actual Greek god Zeus with all godly powers that gods are supposed to have. And Zeus proposes to hire you um, for a design task, right? And says, okay, here's what I want. Um, I'm, I'm going to be designing the afterlife, um, the underworld, right, Hades. And this is where people, of course, are punished after their death. And I want to be able to punish them, and I want the punishment to have certain interesting features, okay? So first of all, there are going to be different degrees of unpleasantness that you can be subjected to after your death. Um, and I guess, I don't know, I've got 100 billion rooms or something here. Uh, and they, they start at neutral, right? Just room temperature, no problems. And they get progressively worse in whatever ways you like. Um, more cockroaches or hotter or muggier or whatever. Yeah, um, up, through, up through all these scales, all right? So I have lots of options about where to place people after they've, after they've died. And, uh, Initially, I want to be able to place them, and you'll see why, not quite anywhere initially, but up to the first 99 billion, 999 million uh, degrees of badness. That's where you, you can start out anywhere there. And um, then at midnight, every night, each soul will be required to exit the room it's in, we'll leave it through a door for another room. And this is as in the Greeks, or at least in Plato, this period in the underworld does not go on forever, okay? It just goes on for, for a million, just for a million days, okay? Uh, so 
at every midnight, you have to leave through a door and go to another room. And, he, and what he wants is that for those million days in succession, it'll always get worse, right? You'll go to the next worst level of badness, All right? So it's just gonna get, you're gonna get more and more miserable, right? And believe me, you deserve it, okay. So you say, all right, fine, Zeus, that's fine. And, and, and you come to terms and you come up with this design pretty straightforward design. Um, you've got all of these rooms, one room representing each level of badness. Uh, and we have them lined up here from the zero room to the dark red room in order of increasing badness. And then you have a single, you have two doors, uh, except in the first room where there's only an exit door, but it, you, you have two doors but there's a turnstile, like a subway turnstile, which is only allows, allows passage in one direction. And of course, you just go from each room and have a turnstile that takes you into the next worst room, and you repeat that a hundred a hundred billion times. Um, and you say, there, done, right? Stick stick somebody anywhere you want and force them out at midnight and they'll always go to the next worst room. And on and on and on for a million, as long as you start far enough below the top, the, the worst room, the, they can do this for a million days in a row. Okay, now you ask for payment, right? But of course, Zeus is not so nice. Zeus says, wait a minute, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention something. Um, I, I actually, put in a really big, massive bulk order for uh, swinging doors. And that's what you have to use, okay? You can't use these turnstile things that only allow motion in one direction. Um, a, a swinging door, if it lets you go from room A to room B, it of necessity allows you to go back from room B to you, room A. And I, I don't want to invest in all these turnstile things so that's what you have to use in this design. And he furthermore says, just so you don't try and weasel out in a certain way, that, that one of the deals is that the soul gets to choose which door they go through at midnight however they want, right? That's unconstrained. You can't, you can't force them to go through a door. They, it, it has to be a completely free choice. This is, this is part of the horribleness of this punishment that you're actually absolutely free at every midnight to go wherever you want. Um, and you can make the choice however you want. And so Zeus says, I'm not gonna pay you until you, until you satisfy these demands. And now you raise what we may call a reversibility objection, okay? So you say, uh, quite reasonably, you say, look, Zeus, what you've now asked me to do is logically impossible. Um, nobody can meet the conditions. It's, it can't be, the conditions you just gave cannot be met because suppose uh, one night a soul goes from room N to room N plus one, like you want through this swinging door. Um, well, the next night, they might choose to go back through that door. It's a swinging door and they'll go back to N. And so instead of things getting worse, they'll get a little bit better, right? Um, I just can't, can't both have swinging doors and have free choice and have a guarantee that things will always get worse, right? You've asked me to do something that just can't be done. And Zeus thinks about it for a minute and says, okay, fair enough. Um, it wasn't really it wasn't really correct for me to to ask this of you, right? Because nobody could satisfy it. But you you make him an offer, okay? And you say, look, Zeus, give me epsilon wiggle room, right? Where epsilon is as small as you like, but not zero, in the following way. Um, look, I you say I I can't do what you wanted, which would be to absolutely guarantee that each soul will always move to the next worst room. But I can make it overwhelmingly likely 
that that will happen. How overwhelmingly, as overwhelmingly as you want, just don't force me to say it's absolutely certain. Okay, so you want, you know, as it were, a point, you know, ninety nine point nine 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 percent chance. I'll give you that. Okay, I can do that. Just don't make it a hundred percent. And and I say to Zeus using some nice. 17th century terminology, 18th century terminology, you can be morally certain that the souls will do exactly what you want them to do, right? That they will make their free choice every night. They'll always go to the next worst room. Um, you, you're not going to be apodictically certain, right? Uh, I, I can't demonstrate that this will happen, but you can be really sure. You can go to sleep at night quite confident that, that these souls are gonna be punished the way you want, right? And Zeus says, okay, good enough, right? I, I understand that, you know, uh, apodictic certainty is impossible, but if you'll give me this kind of moral certainty, that's good enough for me, done deal. You give me the design and I'll pay you, okay? And so then you, here's the second design. And now I hope everybody, and this is kind of the whole point. So the room on the left, the little room with one door is, is the, the neutral room. And that one door from the neutral room leads into room one at the first level of discomfort. Uh, and going out of room one, there are many, 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 many doors. Obviously, there has to be the door that goes back into room zero, but then there are all these other doors that go into the next room, uh, which is indicated as the slightly pinker room around the outside. Okay. And how many, many, many? Well, that depends on how morally certain you want to be, but you get the idea. And then, obviously, from the second room, there are going to be many, 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 many doors that leave, most of which go into the third room of the next degree of badness and so on. And so to be more specific in detail, room zero has a, a single door that goes into room one. Room one has a million and one doors. The one that goes back to zero and a million doors that go to room two. Room two, as I guess that's a trillion a million doors, uh, the million that of course have to be there that go back to room one and then a trillion more that go to room three and so on and so on and so on. Now we're gonna be, you know, we're gonna have a lot of doors involved but that's okay. That's, you know, we weren't restricted on the number of doors we had. And obviously, uh, the, the conditions of how bad the room is are going to be, are, are, can be read off from the number of doors, right? The, the more doors, the worse it is. And uh, you could do it just by listing the number of doors, but that's going to get inconvenient because that number is going to get very large. So uh, at least if we do it in base 10, so we'll do it in base million and one. And so in base million and one, uh, room zero has a million and one to the zero if doors and room, sorry, and room one has a million and one doors and room two has a million and one square doors and so on. Um, so now just by counting doors, we can figure out the level of badness. And now you see, look, the level of badness really is nothing, you know, that was just to, to, to make it clear in your mind what we were doing. Um, now, there's one more thing you require here for all this to work. And you say, you know, Zeus said that the, the, the soul can choose whatever door they want. But of course, if the soul comes in through a certain door and understands what's going on, then they can just loiter around that door until midnight and then go back through it and get back from where they came. And so you say, look, I, I'm not taking away the freedom of choice, but you have to require that the soul drink from the river Lethe every day and forget where they came from. Okay, um, but other than that, they can they they can make the choice however they want. Maybe all the doors look the same. Maybe some of the doors are different colors. Maybe they're different shapes. Maybe they're kind of you know in different locations. I don't care. 
let them decide however they want. Um, I'm not even saying that the way they decide makes every door equally possible as every other door, right? Maybe they like red doors. I don't care. Let them do that. But the deal is that the, the, however the doors differ, if say they differ in color, you arrange that that's statistically independent of where they go, right? So it's not that you paint all the doors going down red and all the other ones green or whatever. You, you just randomly assign all, all the observable characteristics of the doors. And then you say, as long as they don't remember which door they came through, let them choose however they want. And okay, so that's, so, so there's just no way by looking at the doors, the soul can figure out whether a door leads down to room N minus one or up to room N plus one. And on top of this, I mean, notice, there's no problem giving the souls the complete blueprints of hell, right? They can know all this. Nothing has to be hidden from them, right? They can understand the exact architectural structure. And now we give, you know, we give a typicality argument, as we would say. We say, look, in, in, in every room, why should I be so sure that, that the souls are going to constantly be getting worse and worse? Because in every room, overwhelmingly, most of the doors lead to the next higher room. And so I don't care what method they use to decide. We can be morally certain. As I said, you can't be absolutely certain. We know we're giving up on that. But we can be morally certain that they'll pick a door that leads to the next worst room. Um, and if, if, if the level of certainty doesn't suit you, Zeus, that's fine. I'll just go from one in a million to one in a billion to one in a trillion to one in a quadrillion, whatever you want, right? I mean, clearly I can't, again, I can't absolutely guarantee it, but intuitively I can make the likelihood as small as you like that anybody ever gets lucky enough to, to improve their situation at midnight. And so Zeus says, good, you get paid, you, you can retire now, big commission, right? Lots of doors involved and you get 10% of all the door charges and everything. Um, so it's a, it's a happy story for you, if not for the people consigned to hell. All right, um, now imagine that you're a soul in the afterlife and, and you've been given the blueprint of this thing. So you know how it all works. And you know what, that at midnight, you're gonna to have to choose a door and you know you don't remember which door you came in through. Then you're gonna make a prediction, right? By the same, by all of this argument, you say, you know, probably tomorrow I'm gonna to be worse off by one degree of badness. Um, why? Well, obviously, because almost all the damn doors do that and I have no clue which, which the better doors are. And no matter, you know, no matter what method I use for door choosing, and again, it doesn't have to be a method that makes all the doors equally likely, but because of the way things are mixed up, no matter what method I use for door choosing, I'll probably end up worse off. That's my prediction for the future. Okay, that's easy. So I'll predict that, yeah, badness is going to monotonically or almost monotonically increase, right? Or probably for the million days I'm going to be here, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. Maybe I'll be lucky. And for one day, it'll get slightly better. But my prediction, and that prediction will almost always be correct, is that it's just going to get worse and worse. What about retrodiction? Now, this comes to this, this issue about the past hypothesis. I get a good prediction. So I'm going to make that prediction, and the prediction is going to be good. What about retrodiction? OK, again, I'm a soul. I've been provided. I know the map. I understand everything. Um, and now instead of predicting where I'm going to be tomorrow, I asked, I wonder where I was yesterday. And I say, well, look, I'm in room 100. Just by this map, yesterday I was either in 99 or 101. Those are the only ones that connect to room 100. I have no other evidence. I don't remember, right? I drank from Lethe. I don't remember where I was. Uh, what should I conclude about where I was yesterday? Well, now we have just a standard bit of Bayesian reasoning. I have two hypotheses to choose from, H99, that yesterday I was in room 99, and H101, that I was in room 101. Now, there's the only uh, hypotheses that are open. Conditional probability that I would be in room 100 today 
on the hypothesis H99 is almost one, right? Because if I was in 99, I was al would be almost certain to be in 100 today. The conditional probability that I'd be in 100 today if yesterday I was in 101 is tiny. Again, because it's a, there was, as it were, you know, a tiny chance that I would hit a good door. And what are my priors? Well, I don't really care what they are as long as they're not wildly, right? You have no reason to think it really likely that you were in 101, right? So I'm not saying you have to, again, have to say, well, it's 50-50 what my priors are, but just don't make them wildly unbalanced. And then as a good Bayesian, I'm gonna conclude that probably I was in 99. And by the same reasoning, probably before that I was in 98. And by the same reasoning, probably before that I was in 97. And that reasoning will again, in fact, what, whatever you think of it, it will almost always be correct if this is what's going on, right? All the souls will in fact, basically monotonically increase. They're gonna predict they're gonna monotonically increase. They're gonna retrodict that they have been monotonically increasing and they'll be right about it. And so you're gonna say in the past, things were better off and in the, in the future, they'll be worse. Um, now, so if we call the badness, the entropy, um, you're gonna predict that it's gonna monotonically increase. And in the past, it has been continuously and monotonically increasing and it was lower in the past. Notice it is not, the past hypothesis is not being brought in as an extra premise. This is a conclusion, right? There is no bad retrodiction that has to be defeated here. The retrodiction is good. Uh, and, and as I say, in this case, you don't call it the past hypothesis, you call it the past conclusion, right? It's, it's something you, you derive. Um, notice a couple other things. I'm at the end now. I, okay, so, but I started a little late, so I'm just about on target. These are just notes about what I just showed. Um, it doesn't matter if there's a top room. Suppose this thing goes on forever. Suppose it's an infinite structure. Um, that's fine. So the existence of an absolute top room, which is what would correspond to equilibrium, is irrelevant here. Maybe there is none. Maybe, maybe this would continue forever. Uh, completely irrelevant. By the way, if there is a top room and you're wondering what happens in the top room, the answer is you have a certain number of doors that come into the top room and then a million times as many doors exit the top room and return to the top room. They just recycle you there, okay? So if you ever get to the top room, you're just gonna be stuck there for a heck of a long time. And maybe after a long, long time, you'll go down to the next bad room, but then you'll pop right back up to the worst room again. Um, uh, and, and so whether there's an equilibrium room doesn't matter. This is of course important because thermodynamics in classical thermodynamics, the so-called entropy is only definable for the equilibrium states. And, and, and there may not be any, but that's okay. Uh, I, I still have this quantity. Um, now, notice this is the important thing. When the, the modern Boltzmannian understanding of S, equals K L N W. The W no longer means Wahrscheinlichkeit. It means the volume of a, a, a region, the region of phase space you're in where phase space has been partitioned in a certain way, okay? By the thermodynamic parameters. And the idea is, uh, is that you're gonna define entropy as the log of that volume. What's really important is the volume of the region of phase space you're in. Notice that in this definition, in, in this account, and I really want you to take this thing seriously, the volumes of the room are completely irrelevant, right? Volumes make no difference. I don't care what the volume is. What matters is the surface area. And if we assume that the doors are all of equal size and are sort of placed near each other. Uh, all the action is in the relative surface area that is doors going down as opposed to doors going up. 
Why is it the surface area that matters? Because what we care about is the transition from one room to the next room. Which room will you go next? And what determines that is which part of the surface area you pass through and where that surface area goes. The volume of the room you're in plays no role, explanatory role, okay? What you wanna do is look at the boundaries, how big the boundaries are and how they're related, how the boundaries of one room are related to the boundaries of other rooms. Um, now, if in fact the rooms are more or less the same shape and more or less convex, then it'll turn out that when we take the, if we take the log of the volume, we're gonna get something that's proportional to the log of the surface area, right? Because the volume will go up as some characteristic parameter to the N and the surface area as that characteristic parameter to the N minus one. And when I take the log, it just pulls down an N or an N minus one. So that if you're measuring by log, and if the shapes are pretty much the same, then measuring by volume and measuring by surface area are essentially equivalent. But, but nonetheless, I wanna claim it's the surface area that matters because it's the surface area that's doing the explanatory work, okay? So if the quantity K ln volume behaves the way we want in some sense, then the quantity K ln boundary will do just as well. So from a certain functional point of view, one's just as good as the other. But I want to claim it's the boundary that's doing the explanatory work. So it's the boundary you want to be measuring, even though those numbers will turn out to be you know, proportional to one another. OK. Um, now, the other thing to say here is that it's neither the boundary nor the volume alone is doing the correct work. It's those together with how all these regions in phase space have been put together, how, what their relative positions are, right? Because if you just took the same rooms and randomly put the doors in, then almost all the doors from any room would lead to the biggest room immediately, right? That is, you'd, as it were, instantaneously go into equilibrium. That's not what happens. What happens is you're supposed to go continuously through gradual changes from one degree of badness to another, which is like one degree of entropy to another. Um, so you need not just either the volume or the boundary, but you need the precise geometrical arrangement. This is what's done, and this is a standard picture, this is out of one of Penrose's books, of entropy increase using this Boltzmann formula. And you'll notice, yeah, A, the regions have different areas. B, the regions have different perimeters. C, the regions with little tiny perimeters and areas are really adjacent to other ones with really tiny perimeters and areas, right? They didn't have to be, right? You could take all of those same things and rearrange them so that basically everything is just sitting in, a, in, a, in the sea of equilibrium. So it's even though the definition only mentions either the volume or the area, more than just the volume or area is doing the explanatory work. But when you get into the guts of the explanation, you find it's the way the areas or the perimeters, I'm sorry, where, you know, by area, I mean the perimeters, it's the way the perimeters are structured that's doing the explanatory work. Okay, so um, I, this is now just summing up. So entropy, along with volume, pressure, temperature, moles of gas is a concept in classical thermodynamics. If we wanna reduce it, to an underlying microphysical theory, some of the terms must be defined, right, in the proprietary language of the micro theory. And the question is, what are the criteria of adequacy or success of a proposal for such a definition? Uh, we want the definition to provide a conceptual connection that accounts for the success of the original theory, right? Classical thermodynamics worked pretty well, and we want to account for that. Um, we want the definiens to behave at least to a good approximation like the definienda, to a good approximation because as I said, in classical thermo entropy can't decrease and in, the, in statistical theory, it can. More than that, however, I think we want the definitions to reveal the features of the micro theory that explain or account for 
the behavior it, of the reduced theory, right? So it's in those terms that you understand why the original theory, the classical theory worked as well as it did. And my claim is that K ln V is about the same as K prime ln boundary of V, where B V is the boundary of V. As far as this functional behavior goes, they're gonna be the same, right? Anything that one does, the other does, because those two quantities are just proportional to each other. But nonetheless, it's the structure of the boundaries and not the structure of the volumes that accounts for the behavior. Um, and so in classical thermodynamics, we have PV equals NRT. We wanna reduce that to the micro theory. How do we do it? V is defined as the volume, that doesn't change. P is defined as the average momentum flux per unit area which at equilibrium is everywhere, the same everywhere and for all orientations in the unit area, if you're not in a gravitational field. T is defined as the average kinetic energy per particle. And N is defined as the number of moles in the gas. And so by these definitions, you then reduce uh, classical thermodynamics where pressure and temperature are only defined at equilibrium you give microphysical definitions that allow for a more extensive definition, right? Where there can be pressures that are not, uh, that are not, that are not at equal, you're not at equilibrium, but there are still local pressures, there are local temperatures and so on that we define by a coarse graining. So we're improving the theory, right? And in the same way we improve entropy here. In classical thermodynamics, S is only defined for a system at equilibrium and the differences in S are well-defined. We want a microphysical definition of S to recover the classical values for equilibrium and their ratios, but also to be more broadly defined to cover non-equilibrium as well. And in the microphysical definition, we want to recover the second law, but we don't recover it as a law, right? We recover it as a statistical, extremely like, likely thing. Um, and we know that has to happen because of the reversibility objections. So, uh, sorry, I'm going a little late, but I'm, I am almost done. Sorry, I forgot how long this goes. So uh, the second law in the classical case only pertains to comparison between equilibrium states because S is only defined for equilibrium states. But once we expand the definition so we can define non -equal entropy of non-equilibrium systems, we want to demand not just that the entropy never go down, but that it rises continuously and not by sudden jumps, right? We want this entropy that we can now track through time to rise, you know, sort of continuously and at a certain rate from the initial state to the end state. Um, the classical definition, of course, pertains objectively to single systems. And we want the new definition to, uh, to be an individualist one, which is why we like Boltzmann better than Gibbs. Uh, and both of the, both the usual thing, S equals K ln V and S equals K prime ln V V will work if we add some more conditions. Um, we require that the phase phase cells, what are those conditions? We define this in terms of phase phase cells. Uh, they have to be structured correctly in terms of which, which cells are adjacent to which. The adjacency is by definition sharing of a boundary. That's what adjacency is. So the boundary structure, it's the boundary structure that accounts for the tendency of the entropy to behave as we want it to. And therefore I claim my definition provides the correct definition of entropy in a system relative to the partition of phase space. All right, so there's a, a, a fairly bold claim, all right, but I'm gonna make it. Um, and, what you see, if you do it this way as a bonus, is that the explanation of the second law as morally certain is pretty much independent of dynamics, right? is pretty much independent of the dynamics, right? We don't care about the dynamics. We don't care about how souls were choosing which door to go through. Um, we just cared about the relative proportions of the boundaries that led up and led down. And so we really don't need to go into the details of the dynamics, and we don't need to, to cure any retrodiction problem that's supposed to arise. I think, yeah, that's it. Okay. There you go. Hey, Tim.
So can you say something about how your argument is connected with the view that time has an intrinsic direction independently of the direction of entropy increase or decrease? Well, um, it just presupposes from beginning to end that it does, because it uh -huh. does. I mean, look, if you're, if you're even in the game of suggesting entropy could decrease, which is the whole point of the reversibility objection, then you're already in a game where you're assuming the direction of time is independent of the, direct, uh, of the entropy gradient, right? So th th this whole discussion from beginning to end assumes that time is time, right? But if someone was, yes, but if someone was interested in, in the project of, of accounting for the directionality of time, um, they would still go in the direction of introducing the past hypothesis, the so-called past hypothesis. I, well, I, I guess I'll just repeat what I said. If somebody was interested in trying to reduce the direction of time to the entropy gradient, then they're not going to understand from the beginning what this deal about, gosh, entropy might decrease can even mean. Because by that proposal, it's not even, as it were, logically possible or metaphysically possible for entropy to decrease. But that means they're just not in the discussion that was going on, right? I mean, everybody who understood that the reversibility objection was a valid objection was obviously not operating under, under, the, under the thought that they could produce that kind of reduction. Um, so I'm not quite sure, you know, you're, you're asking me to take the discussion, I think, not just out of my context, but out of historical context to ask, how someone would do that. Right, oh, I think that's what happened. Yeah. It was taken out of historical context, right? Yeah. Um, make I don't, mind. yeah, so I, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Um, Jacob has a whole bunch of questions. So Jacob, please go ahead. Thank you very much. I've written them in the chat, but in case people can't, can't see the chat, let me just read them out loud. Um, so the first question, um, the most naive guess about the initial state of the universe, should such an initial state exist, is that it's the most probable kind of state, which naively means an extremely high entropy state. If there is a maximum entropy of the, if there's maximum value of the entropy, as appears to be the case for all known physical systems, and that most probable initial state should be one of maximal entropy. That would seem to correspond to us starting in hell's worst room, or nearly so. Uh, but then we don't get a thermodynamic arrow of time or a decreasing entropy. Um, uh, increasing entropy is what I should have said. Uh, e even should the entropy fluctuate downward enormously, then we would be precisely in the case that retrodictions are poor because the previous state was higher entropy. So it seems like to get the world we actually see, we do need an assumption that the entropy was once very low, and that's precisely the past hypothesis. How else do we get around this problem? We don't make stupid, naive guesses that we have no reason to make, right? Why would I make some naive guess? I don't even know what probability means there. Why should I suppose, because uh, one room has more volume than another, that naively I ought to expect I started out in a larger volume room? What, there's, no, there's no argument there. There's no physical principle, right? What I learn, I learn about the dynamics. I learn by looking at the world about the dynamics, and I figure out what the past was like. I don't make stupid, naive guesses. OK, that's a, that's a, that's a, fair, a fair point. But then my second question. So the architecture of hell that you've described appears to be time reversal invariant, right? Where uh, it's just, just spatial structure. It, sure. It's just spatial structure, just exists yeah. eternally. It's an eternal hell. Yeah. So what if Zeus is devious and sends some in, sends uh, in some backward time souls whose internal processes and experience of time is reversed? Everything about them is reversed. They see clocks in reverse. Everything about them internally is completely in reverse, and they go through the doors in reverse time. Wouldn't they see badness increasing as T goes the other way? And isn't that the whole spirit of the objection to Boltzmann's H theorem? Wouldn't they use Bayes' theorem in reverse? Look, I mean, I don't even know what a reverse person is. The fact is, you're going to, to, to fit this into my story, you're going to have to reverse the effects of Lethe, which was to make sure. you forget. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Lethe is, as it were, going to be some magical river that would point you to the right, point you to the, to, to, to the correct doors. Right. Okay. If there are magical rivers that point you to the correct doors, we all know it's possible for entropy to decrease, right? And if you give magical rivers that'll point something to, to those very few doors that'll decrease, it'll decrease. So what? There right. are no the, such magical rivers. The, 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 the hell that you've described is itself time reversal invariant. 
So at, at, Again, it, it has it, no time in it. It's just space. Right, right. So, but, but the point is, it, it seems like there's some time reversal, non-invariant assumption you've made about what goes on with the people, the souls in hell. Because I, I can take everything you've just said about the souls in hell and literally reverse everything internal about them and how they experience time. And hell looks exactly the same. They should go through the doors in a way that is just the, the time reversal and variant version of forward going souls. And this is exactly what the fundamental you know, idea behind the objection to Boltzmann's H theorem was. I don't quite see how we get around that problem. Well, I don't, I, first of all, look, if you, what you're deciding to do, I guess, is take a bunch of souls that have been there for a long time, right? That have, have worked their way up through many, many levels. Take their state and exactly velocity reverse it. That's not exactly, no, that's not exactly what I mean. I don't know I mean what you're when, doing then. When Zeus pops souls into, into hell, yeah. some of them he sends forward in time. Their internal processes, their thought processes, how they move, how they act is in some sense a forward time you know, thing. And other souls he sends in and he makes everything about their experience exactly in reverse. And hell looks the same to both of them because hell is time reversal invariant. And the souls who are forward time, you know, going, they're going to see, you know, the badness increasing. And the souls who are time reversal, time reversed, are going to see badness increasing in their forward direction of time. And it, it doesn't seem like there's any way to distinguish between them. Okay, let, 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 let's just take a simpler case. Right now, you're having an experience. You're looking around and you're seeing the room, right? Or you're seeing the yes. computer screen. Uh, there, we could take your present state and the state of the room around you and imagine a velocity reversal of it. Now, you're making an assumption here that that velocity reversed thing, the re velocity reversed you, I guess you're making an assumption it would have conscious experiences and, there, and its conscious experiences would be just like yours. Are you assuming that? Yeah, but I think maybe it's more. Okay, than I think just, that's all wrong. I think there's no reason to believe any of that. Right, but I think maybe it's more than just velocity reversal. That there, there is some. Well, I, I don't want to take up any more time. I want to give other people a chance to, to ask questions. But um, I'm curious if other people uh, want to chime in on this. I mean, I, just to make the point, look, I can I, I can imagine your situation, velocity reversing it, where now light is being shot out of your, off your retinas out into the room. And in, in some rather inexplicable way, the color of the light coming off your retinas happens to match the, uh, the, the chemical structure of the part of the wall that your, your eyes are pointed at. But for no explicable reason, except that you took a normal person and reversed them, right? And so perfectly understandable correlations for the original person become completely mysterious and unexpectable a atypical things in the reverse situation. But th that's why we don't expect those things to happen and they never do. Right, but I guess what I'm saying, suppose we have hell as you've described it and we have souls experiencing hell and their badness is increasing. And suppose I yeah. create a hell prime and hell yeah. prime is a duplicate of hell. It is completely the same architecturally. It's also eternal. Yeah. Uh, but but we we just take the entire story and time reverse it. Um, that, that is, we have these two hells existing in parallel and time goes one way for one hell and time goes the other way for the other hell. If I just superimpose the two hells on top of each other, I have the same architecture. And yet I have people I, going I, one way in one hell and people but, going the other so, way in the other. So all I can say is I, and I, I, I literally have no idea what that means. I, I'm, I'm, I, the reason I can't, respond in, a, in maybe what you would find to be a more helpful way is I don't, I just don't know. If you tell me I have one hell, put a person who's built like this in it, what will they do? Put a person who's built like this in it, what will they do? Can you construct a person who will somehow, well, taking into account whatever drinking from Lethe and all that stuff will somehow make all the right lucky guesses to always get better and better and better? Yeah, there are such you, there, such a thing exists, right? We know that exists. We know you could design such a being if you were omniscient and knew everything, right? Um, but good luck. I mean, it ain't gonna happen by accident. 
Whereas, whereas if you just take a regular person off the street and stick them in this thing, they're going to get worse and worse. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for your answer. Thank you. Uh, next in line, we have uh, Nick. Nick, please go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, my question, I actually was just wondering about, um, I think I was a bit confused about the, the analogy and the relationship to uh, statistical mechanics. And in particular, so you, you kind of were, it seemed like you were saying that the number, like the doors, the number of doors that corresponds to some sort of like feature of the boundaries of a region phase space and nothing mm -hmm. to do with, or not nothing to do, but not the area. So I took your, what you to be saying there is that the reason that in statistical mechanics that the majority of microstates in um, a particular, corresponding to a particular microstate, the reason it always goes to a, a region of larger entropy or a bigger region is per your definition due to the nature of the boundary mm -hmm. okay and but i was i think i just didn't see how that so when i was listening to your the the parable i i even wrote down when you're talking about the doors uh, you, you came to the example with um or the the point where you said ah oh, designed a room with a bunch of doors um, and then a larger room with even more doors and I wrote down ah the doors is the number of microstates or the area or the sorry the volume of phase space so why is the no it's not why why would you think that the number of doors in a room is not a measure of its volume if anything it's a reflection of its air, of its surface area yeah but so this is why I was. I think I, I mean, I can I put lots I, and lots of doors in a room with very small volume. If it happens to be a real skinny little room, you know, that wraps around, it, it's just not true. What you're saying is just not true. You're just projecting the way you think about entropy from the normal story onto my story, but it doesn't belong there. Yeah, but I don't, I didn't think that the, like the volume of the room in your exam, in your parable even mattered at all. So like, it I, didn't. I was, that was the point. Yeah, but I don't think that's the proper, or I'm not sure if that's a proper analogy to the phase space because the point of the, the volume in phase space is that there's a lot of microstates and each of those microstates is determining where no, that that's, history that, goes. In my story, that plays no role in the, in the explanation. Uh, okay. All, all you're telling me is that the standard explanation is unlike mine. It is, uh, correct. No, oh, okay, that's fine, but I just wanted to, so the, so what is it about the boundary of the Look, uh, if, region if and phase space? What we care is how the entropy is going to change, right? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what we're focused on. The way the entropy changes depends upon which part of the boundary you go through. If the, if the entropy, the value of entropy is fixed to a, an element of the partition. Right. And we want to say, okay, I mean, this element of the partition that has this entropy. I'm now going to go into another element of the partition that has another entropy. What's going to determine that? What's going to determine that is what other elements of the partition are adjacent and how much of the surface area, boundary of the one I'm in, leads to various different other values. I mean, is that because, uh, like, no matter which microstate, so you pick us any point in the yeah, phase space. Talking about microstates is just taking you off topic. Uh, okay. Uh, well, but I mean, the microstates are are there. Each one has a trajectory. They're, right? they're just not. They're not playing the explanatory role. I I understand, but is like the idea that um, the reason it matters which what they go through is because ones that are say in the center are never going to cross the boundary. Is that the claim? No, they'll eventually cross. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm I'm assuming again. Sure. I mean, you could worry about dwell times, but that's a different issue. It's not actually anything that's even, even discussed no, 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 in classical no, no, no. thermodynamics. The, the, the dwell time is going to be how long it takes you to get from one boundary to the next boundary you hit. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that will depend upon more than just the surface area. It's going to depend in, in a more particular way on the geometry and so on. But but the standard law, the second law doesn't actually even mention dwell time. So it doesn't come into this particular. No, way. sure. But what about, I mean, the, the, I guess it's the, since the density is the same everywhere, then, okay. That density of what? I don't know. The, what, 
the density of the uh, I guess it would no never mind that was uh, it doesn't matter I, I suppose okay so so it's the the point is like uh, just as in the circle example right the interesting or the actual useful definition was the definition that had to do with the radius not the other yeah. things and right. in this case the actual useful definition on in your view is the the size of the boundary or something right. to do with the boundary. That's right. It's, it, it, it adverts to the boundary structure and not to the volume structure. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, thanks. That, yeah, that's what I wanted to know. Okay, thank you. And next, uh, we have David. David, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, um, hi, Tim. Um, that, was, that was great. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, the, the first thing to say, maybe just to, to be on the same page, I don't think there's any controversy, at least there isn't any controversy that I know about, that the sort of Bayesian story you told about arriving at a conclusion that has the form of the past hypothesis is the correct natural history of our uh, of our arriving at the conclusion. That is, we see, you know, we see that ice almost always melts. We we assign, uh, you know, we 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 have a half melted piece of ice in front of us. Um, um, we assign what look like reasonably well-balanced priors to various microstates 10 minutes ago. We feed in the, the, this observational fact that ice is almost always observed to melt, and we reach that conclusion and we work our way back. The past, something like the past hypothesis stated as a hypothesis is not supposed to be an account of how we do Retrodictions. It's supposed to be an. It's supposed to be once the scientific project is done, as it were, an element of the scientific explanation of why the inferences we made in the way we made them came out as well as they did. Okay. So uh, th this is just sort of setting the table. I don't think mm -hmm. there's any controversy, and I don't think somebody who says they're interested in the past hypothesis is in any way disputing this Bayesian story you tell as the sort of correct natural history of how we arrived at these conclusions about the distant past in the first place. But um, with that on the table, there are a number of things, and I think a couple of earlier question, questioners were sort of gesturing in this direction, but let me try one more time. It feels like there are a bunch of things about the, the story of the damned um, that you told um, that are considered as analogies to the, to the statistical mechanical case, maybe, or at least people are sensing, are maybe dangerously misleading. Here's an example. Um, um, so, so the walls of these rooms are supposed to correspond to the boundaries in phase space between different macrostates. Yep. Okay. In this statistical mechanical case, at least in the classical statistical mechanical case, the fact that the uh, the fact that the trajectories of of these systems are, you know, obey deterministic equations of motion means, for example, that any, if I, if I take the doors, at least crudely, we can loosen this up later, but take the doors crudely, ideally, to correspond to points along the boundary, okay? Or maybe very small, yeah, small, uh, small, inter small intervals small. along the boundary, yeah, okay? Yeah. Small Let's measurables. First, yeah. Right. Let's first approximate them by points, and then, and then we can loosen it up. If we approximate them by points, then here's what seems like a bad disanalogy between your story and statistical mechanics. If we approximate them by points, then all the doors are necessarily going to be one-way doors, not two-way doors. 
any point on the boundary since it's sitting on a deterministic trajectory through phase space is either going to lead you from room 11 to room 10 or from room 10 to room 11. It can't lead both ways. These aren't swinging doors. These are turnstiles, okay, like you were saying before. Second of all, and this is the point of the reversibility objection, I take it. There's a trivial argument by reversing the velocities, okay, that there is an exact one-to-one -one correspondence right. between the set of doors leading from room 10 to room 11 and the set of doors leading from room 11 to room 10. Okay. Yes. And this is the kind of, so, um, Going back to, so we conclude in our, in, in the, in exactly the Bayesian way that you talked about, okay, that as you put it, unless our priors are wildly imbalanced, okay, we should, we should conclude that the entropy keeps getting lower in the past, okay. But what happens when we go and develop statistical mechanics, okay, um, um, uh, uh, on the micro level, okay, um, and, and especially in light of the reversibility objections, okay, and especially in light of the sort of version of the reversibility objection applied to boundaries that I just formulated for you, the trouble is that it begins to look like what counts as a wildly imbalanced prior and what counts as not a wildly imbalanced prior from the microscopic point of view is not what we would have originally thought, okay? Somebody is sitting there in room 10, okay? And they have a microscopic model of the situation in front of them. And they know from their microscopic model that the structure of this thing they're sitting in is not at all of the kind you described because all of the doors are in fact one-way doors. Okay, and in fact, the, deter the dynamics determines uniquely which door you'll exit by, given which door you entered by, and so on and so forth. Ho hold on just one minute. They're going to say, hey, there are, there are exactly as many doors leading from, uh, leading from 11 to 10 as there are doors leading from 10 to 11. Moreover, there are way, way more doors leading from 11 to 10 than there are doors leading from nine to 10, okay? And so reasoning that way, they come up with a very different notion of what's a balanced and imbalanced prior than the one we correctly naively started out with when we were inferring the past hypothesis in the first place. So if you begin to consider details like this, I don't see how these reversibility objections lose any of their force in your model, except insofar as your model is really distorting rather than illuminating the statistical mechanical case. Okay, let me now um, diagnose just what happened. You played a, 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 an, an, a, you know, a completely unjustifiable trick. Sure, you go down to points, points of zero measure. Then no, 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 let me finish. No, let me finish. Okay. You go down to points, points of zero measure. You met, you then say there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. That tells me that they have the same cardinality. We knew that. Yes, measured in terms of cardinality of points, there are as many points going down as going up. That's not what you measure. What you did was just silly. It was Tim, just silly. This you went down to the points that have measure zero and Tim, you compare their cardinality. Tim, this doesn't depend on... The argument you just gave does. No, it does the argument you just gave. It was, but it doesn't depend on this idealization, as I said at the beginning, that the doors correspond to points. If the doors correspond, if you have a sufficiently small but finite region of the boundary, okay, if, if you know, 
um, um, it, the, the boundary is either going to be a boundary which is dominated by, by trajectories going from room 11 to room 10, or it's going to be a region dominated by uh, trajectories going from room 10 to room 11. Or rather, let me reverse the reasoning, okay? You make the intervals of the boundary finite, but small enough so that that's true. Okay, of course, there's a way of doing that. This doesn't depend on the doors corresponding to points. What did your one to one course you in the middle of your argument, you mentioned a one to one correspondence? Yes, that there was is between points and necessarily between that's true, Tim, but it's absolutely an essential. And why well, did you mention it? To, as I said at the beginning, I mentioned it to keep things simple. Here's a claim. Wait, wait, Tim. Here's a claim. David, don't give a bad argument and then say, I gave a bad argument to keep things simple. Well, actually, that's the truth. But but <laughs> let me but let me give let me give a better argument. Okay. Here's a claim. Okay. Um, take a reasonable measure, and we'll have to discuss what this is, okay, over the surface area of the boundary. Okay. Yeah. Claim. The amount of area that's taken up, okay, by passages from room 11 to room 10 will be equal to the amount of area that's taken up by passages from room 10 to room 11. And moreover, the amount of area that's taken up by passages from room 11 to room 10 will far exceed the amount of area that's taken up by passages from room nine to room 10. Uh, I, I, I'm, now I just really have to ask you, I don't understand. The, the argument goes, you're inside a cell. Yeah. Right, you're inside cell 10. Yeah. Every exit is either gonna take you to nine or to 11. Correct. And the question is- Many of the doors it? aren't exits at all though. Of course, yeah. many of the doors, many of the regions of the boundary are not options for an exit at all, because they're regions that are that are taken up with that are filled up with points that are sitting on trajectories that don't exit room ten. They're sitting on trajectories that enter room ten. I, no, we're I in a deterministic understand. theory here. Every point in the phase space picks out a trajectory. But I, I don't, I don't understand. Okay, we're, we're really not communicating. Good. There's phase space. There's a partition of it. Yes. Right. Every element of that partition has a boundary. Yes. Correct. Uh, every part of the boundary of one partition connects to another part of the partition. Yes. Correct. I can measure those. Yes. Correct. All right. From room 10, from partition point 10, we're assuming it only bounds on 11 and 9. Correct. So its entire boundary can be divided into the part that goes in that bounds to 9 and the part that bounds to 11. Correct. Claim. The, in that natural measure, overwhelmingly most of it bounds to 11. Correct. And irrelevant to your argument. There's a further distinction that needs to be made. What, why? I, I'm, I'll tell David, you why. David, let me, David, wait, let me just answer what you said. Yeah. I am now in room 10. Yeah. If there are points on the boundary that, as it were, correspond to things coming into room 10, one thing I know is I'm not on that because I'm in room 10. I, I'm, I'm, I lost. No, it. you just said some of the, you, you said. Their point, you're identifying the points now also with which way the thing is moving across. Correct, correct. Fine, I'm in room 10. If there right. are ones that correspond to trajectories that enter room 10, they're out of the calculation. I know they're wrong. You know they're wrong as what? what? What do you what? mean? I'm I'm now, not, that doesn't correspond to what my trajectory was. What do you mean? I'm in room 10, I got there somehow. What do you I know, about? but I'm as, asking what is gonna happen at midnight tonight? No, I'm no, not no, no. no, you're also asking questions like, where did I come from? But I, the, 
the the way I again, the, I, I don't understand. The way I answered those is by the argument that I gave that you said was okay. No, You're taking I back said, that it was no, okay. No, 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 no. I now know the complete laws of physics. Now we're in a different position. We're not talking about the natural history of these inferences before we knew the complete laws of physics. We're now looking at how they look, okay, in light of knowledge of the complete laws. I'm in room 10, okay? Uh -huh. I ask how I got there, uh -huh. okay? And Tim wants me to say that I should calculate the way I got there, okay, from by, by taking ratios of the boundaries I could have crossed to get in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And I'm saying that the that the boundary that that I could have crossed from um, from region eleven to get no in. no uh, no no I'm sorry I, I, I said yes when I should have said no. Okay. I, I calculate I calculate as I did. I know where I know. Yesterday, I was in one of two places. Right. You agree about that, right? We do. And then I, 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 I take those two hypotheses that yesterday I was lower and yesterday I was higher. And I ca calculate the conditional probability on each of those that I would be where I am now. Mm -hmm. No, that's no longer the right way to do it. Now, I mean, you need a prior. And the question is, what is the prior going to be? And then there's going to be there's going to be hand waving about some priors being wildly imbalanced, mm -hmm. so on. But we don't need to do that anymore. We have a much better way to do the calculation now because Tim has told us that what we should be doing is is counting the number of doors by which we could have gotten in. Okay, but. And if we can, and the claim is that if you count the number of doors, it's much more likely that you came in from 11 than that you came in from nine. But uh, Tim, I, I feel bad. There are lots of hands up here. We can, we can, we can continue this. Um, I just sort of wanted to put it on the table. Let me also say in advance, I'm going to have to run to teach a class. It's not because I'm not interested. Um, 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 it's really nice, and I don't want to nurse the wound forever, Dave. <laughs> no, no, and I don't want to take up more time here. <laughs> Thank you very much for this very nice exchange. Um, the next question is from Michael. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one kind of uh, connects to the discussion we've just had, namely. Um, your argumentation assumes uh, seems to assume that the dynamics is stochastic, so you make like random transitions from one room to the other, and in particular, um, this uh, drinking from the river, which, which erases correlations. That is a natural consequence of like um, random perturbations that uh, erase correlations, and um, also this uh, free decision which door to take is. Um, something that features stochasticity. But if you have a deterministic uh, theory, then uh, the object reversibility objection arises in a completely different way. And I think in that case, um, you really would need something like a past hypothesis. And uh, the second question is that you've um, based your comparison on um, one particular of, of the different uh, forms of entropy on a particular um, problem, namely the irreversibility of adaption. Now there are others. There is um, in particular a very beautiful paper from 2014 by um, Stefan Hilbert et al, where they compare various types of entropy in terms of how they can reproduce the laws of thermodynamics. And their conclusion was that the um, Gibbs volume entropy is um, the best one in particular better than the Boltzmann entropy in terms of satisfying, for example, the zeroth law of thermodynamics. Okay, so let me, uh, let me go back. The, 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 I am not assuming anything about the dynamics, and I'm certainly not assuming the dynamics is fundamentally stochastic. The, the assumption that goes into this, the analog in the argumentation given by Boltzmann and Maxwell is the statistical independence assumption which came to be known as the Stossal Ansatz. Now the Stossal Ansatz does not commit you to anything about the dynamics. 
okay? It's just a statistical independence assumption. The statistical independence assumption here is that in the long term, whether you pick a, a door that goes up or down will be statistically independent of whether it goes up or down, right? That, that is the proportion that you pick that go up will be essentially the same as the proportion that are up. And the proportion that you pick that go down will be essentially the same as the proportion that go down, right? And so if I make the proportion that go down tiny, tiny, tiny relative to the, the number that go up, then almost always you'll pick one that goes up, whether you're using a deterministic or stochastic, stochastic thing. The thing about Lethe was not that. The thing about Lethe was just to keep you from cheating Right, which I mean, this is not something that Maxwell ever worried about that the, the atoms would gang up on him and 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 um, settle on some plan to thwart his 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 calculation. Right, you don't really need anything. He never uses anything like that. It's all built into the statistical independence assumption, right? Which is in a single case the Stoessel ansatz, and then in repeated cases the hypothesis of molecular chaos. And those were, of course, completely compatible conceptually with the underlying microdynamics being perfectly deterministic. So, so that whole thing is, no, that's just off. No, it, basically, I didn't talk about the microdynamics because the microdynamics don't really come into the, into the discussion much as they don't come into Maxwell's discussion and much as they don't come into Boltzmann's discussion. What's doing the work in the calculation is the Stoessel ansatz, which is a statistical independence assumption. And that's what drives the typicality argument. Okay, so that was the first part. Um, the second part, look, whether there is a zeroth law, I mean, I don't even want to, you know, th that would be another talk. I don't believe there is a zeroth law to give you a short answer. So I'm, I'm not concerned about what definition better explains the zeroth law. Um, but, but, but this is just not the topic. I'm worried about the second law here. They're also mentioning the second law in that paper. Uh, um, fine, I'm not familiar with yeah, the okay. paper, but I'm not. Yeah, okay. so I'm not in a position to to intelligently comment on it. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, but uh, re regarding the Stoßzahlansatz, uh, um, as far as I know, the Stoßzahlansatz is just something like a past hypothesis. If you no, I'm saying it, it it's is not what it says. It says nothing about the past. It says nothing about the past. Do you know what it says? Uh, yes, I do. It's um, okay. It so, says um, nothing about the past. It says about the future. It says it says that if we we take a bunch of target particles, okay, and we want to know how many collisions will there be among those target particles from some attacking set that have a, a basically the same incoming velocity, and we calculate the total area where those attacking particles would have to be to suffer a collision in a certain period of time, okay? And we take the proportion of that area to the total volume available. And the Stoßall ansatz is that the, the number that will collide will be essentially that same proportion. That's not, that has nothing to do with the past. It's not no past hypothesis in that. I, th I think that's just wrong. So if you um, consider more general derivations of this type of which the um, Boltzmann equation is specific type in the um, Mori 20 formalism. So um, I think David Wallace has written things on that. Can you stop like citing of papers I have not read? I'm telling you what M Maxwell and Boltzmann actually did. And the Stoßall yeah. ansatz is a name for an assumption that went into their derivation. And I'm telling you what that is. Yeah, yes, that, that's true. But, but wouldn't you say if you want to explain statistical mechanics and we should not look at some um, like early 20th century statistical mechanics and we should look at um, what no, modern statistical mechanics has, has made correct. much, much progress since early 20th no, century. No, I disagree. I think that the statistical independence assumption lies at the center of basically every statistical argument. Bell uses a statistical independence assumption. The PBR theorem uses a statistical independence assumption. The method of, of controlled experimental tests for causal things uses a statistical independence assumption. All statistical arguments use statistical independence assumption. That's without it, you don't get anywhere. And Maxwell knew what he was doing.
Okay, okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. I don't think that uh, won't get us anywhere, but um, I can send you derivations if you want. Sure. Okay, so um, now it's uh, Wayne's turn. So please, Wayne, go ahead. Okay. Um, thanks, Tim. I really liked this talk, and I like the you know, the architecture of hell analogy. I don't think I've heard you use that before. Um, I think this is a very promising suggestion, um, but obviously, if you're going to make the extension to statistical mechanics, then more details need need to be um, filled in. And I guess one that like raise a, a couple worries and um maybe make some suggestions about how that would work um so in your um in your discussion with um, um Jake, jacob um i think it's important to you know, rel re you know rel um rel relevant to that i think it's important to to mention that there is a temporally asymmetric um element to your story about the people in hell and that's the drinking from the the, the waters of leith and forgetting you know there isn't a corresponding magic river which you drink from and it tells you where you're going to go right. and um i think what you want from this sort of picture in the statistical mechanics is that there's going to be some kind of forgetting of the past, as it were, like some kind of lethean dynamics that um, once you're in a region that um, the, the, the probability of exit, exiting it given a, a, a very, a part of the boundary is proportional to the size of the boundary. And um, that will depend on the, the dynamics and some notion of what counts as probable or improbable. And you know, I, I do think that probably very weak assumptions about the, the dynamics, plausible ones will give you this, plus judgments of what's probable and improbable that are basically no, no more than, than, than what's encoded in this statistical, statistical independence condition, which I think you're absolutely right that that is at the heart of all non-equilibrium um, thermodynamics, and you're right in your response to Michael that it it doesn't say anything about the past. It's, it says it, it talks about what is about to happen. Now, I think it's that in itself is a. I, I think that not everyone appreciates it. That in itself is a temporal asymmetry, because I think that what a lot of people want is that whatever you say about the past, you have to say about um, you know. Uh, whatever you say about um, you know certain you know, pro pro probability of certain states according to what they're about to do should apply to the velocity reversed set of states about what they were previous previously did, and I think that you're absolutely right. That's a completely unwarranted assumption, but I think it's an assumption that a lot of people in this discussion have been implicitly making. Right. So get rid of that. It, yep. it had, you know, uh, um, you know, we never any had any warrant for it. Now, my worry, so I think, is, um, is, um, I'm not sure I know actually how to understand um, measure on the, on regions of the boundary. You know, you, you invoked a natural measure, yeah. but I'm not really sure, sure what it what that is, and let me tell you why. Um, and I think the sort of pictures we draw like on two dimensional pa paper is, is a bit, bit misleading because we've got some embedding in, of the space into R2 already. Yeah, yeah. But, but we're talking about phase space. Right? And of course there's gonna be lots of embeddings of phase space into um, R to the, uh, you know, R to the six N, um, you know, for every coordinatization Give, you know, given any of those, there's going to be a, a, a notion of volume of regions of the phase space. It turns out that if we take canonical coordinates and use those to define a volume, hey, it doesn't matter which canonical coordinates we use, it's the same one. Okay, mm -hmm. and that's what you, you mean when you talk about the natural measure of volume. Yeah. Okay, now take a region of the phase space 
and you know it's got a boundary which is going to have one dimension one one less mm -hmm. i won't always be able to find a, a canonical coordinates such that that boundary is a constant value value for one so that there's yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. so i'm not sure i know what to you know how how to um talk about area of the value except like here here's one suggestion okay. and this you might not like this because it might tie to too much to partic to particular dynamics but you know, given the actual Hamiltonian, given the actual dynamics, at any given time, there's going to be a point, there's going to be a set of points on the boundary. And I can um, then just take a, a very short time before or after that, you know, take that set and, and for any region of the boundary, I can, you know, talk about to the region, you know, the, 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 the tra trajectories within that cross the bound the, the boundary and there's going to be a certain volume co corresponding to delta t for that set of trajectories and then okay then i've got um leo leo measure of that yeah and for small delta t becomes an area on the boundary i i think that's that, that's probably the most natural way to make sense of it um but it's not necessarily going to be the same if I vary the dynamics, but I'm not sure that that's a problem. Yeah, I, I, so, uh, I mean, I, you're asking a technical question I haven't thought about, um, but let me make some okay. comments about it. Um, yeah. The first one is, of course, at the end, we want a typicality argument, which means what we really want to be able to do is say that that the amount of boundary that goes down is really small compared to the amount of boundary that goes up um and there may be disagreements about exactly how to measure but all but nonetheless in any reasonable way you get really small okay. right i mean that's the the, the you know, sort of what's underlying any general typicality argument okay. um i guess having not thought about it this may amount to what you were saying was that i was assuming yeah if you want to do something precise you know you have the the Louisville measure um maybe this amounts to the same thing if i if i take any n minus one dimensional surface and then take all the points that are within some small epsilon of it right then i'll get a volume um and okay then, but, okay this this is i mean maybe that so. gives me the wrong thing but i but i I'm, well, well, well no if, what head. you said just you know is it uh, this is why it's misleading to you know we've got these pictures on two two yeah, it's a symplectic because, manifold and i'm not my right 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 so we don't actually have a you know we don't have a distance between points on 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 on, on phase space right right, right. So, okay so, so we've got just a volume measure right right so, yeah right. i mean maybe what you suggested would work perfectly well right I so so you know we can take leave a measure and project project it down onto a um energy and energy surface because then what you do is you take um regions between two energy surfaces and you're and you're using energy as, as as the distance right 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 but you know just take arbitrary you know six n minus one surfaces and and, and say well you know what counts as two surfaces that are constant distance between you know that that in general won't won't be well defined so the hope is that even if this isn't unambiguously definable that for a reason for a reasonable range of of, of ways of doing it uh, um that won't matter too much right big and small will come out the same right or close enough to yeah close enough to the same it won't, won't matter yeah um that strikes me as plausible, but to actually have an account, it, it, those details need to be filled in. Right, right. And and look, if, if they can't be filled in, and, and you're right, I have not thought through the details right. of dealing with symplectic manifolds yeah. instead of just n, you know, right. uh, six n dimensional spaces. Um, at least you would learn also that the, the pictures that Penrose draws and the pictures that all of us have seen a million times right that made us think we understood something about the second law i guess they have the same problem because you think 
What's absolutely doing the right. work in those pictures is the structure I'm talking about. So yeah, if you can't make rigorous technical sense of it, then you ought to at least be aware that the way at least I've been thinking about things in general is just wrong or or has some fatal. Well, I think those those problem. those pictures do create an, an illusory sense that it's more, more readily understandable than it is. Yeah, I mean, so that's yeah, that's I mean, that's something I need to think about and just actually do some, you know, technical and and uh, I, I think I understand your suggestion. Whether I can think of another one, I mean, I would have to reflect on it. Good. Okay, thank you, uh, Tim. If you agree, uh, we can take uh, the last two questions. We will uh, go a little bit. Oh, look, time. I'm fine. I'll stay here as long as people want to. Oh, that's great. Come so, on. Maneli, you're the next. Please go. So. Thanks, Tim, for the talk. Uh, it's the second time that I'm seeing it now. And uh, my question is about your characterization of the past hypothesis in the standard Boltzmannian account, and then your uh, past inference or your, 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 your explanation of the past hypothesis as really a conclusion of a certain argument. Mm -hmm. So David, I think, alluded to this in his first question. Um, I don't think that the past hypothesis and the standard Boltzmannian account is an unjustified uh, assumption that we just impose for no good reason or argument, right? And the standard Boltzmannian explanation, we start from some empirical fact about we look out into the world, say planet Earth, we see order, we see a state of less than maximum entropy or a state of uh, lower entropy than we might expect just based on Boltzmann's descript definition of entropy. And then we ask, how do we explain this? And there are two possibilities. One is that the state of the world locally is a fluctuation from some higher entropy state, from some thermal equilibrium state. If that's uh, the explanation, then we would expect that uh, the, the most probable fluctuation would be one that just produces order the order that we locally see. So that if we look out beyond Earth, let's say, we're not gonna see order, we're gonna see disorder, we're gonna see a bunch of stuff mixed up. The other explanation is that the initial state of the world at some earlier point in time was some low entropy state such that when we go and look out beyond Earth, we see order, right? We see order not just on Earth, but we see stars and galaxies and whatever else. So now we do more observations. We look beyond Earth. We see that there is indeed more order beyond just our local conditions on Earth. And then we make an inference to the best explanation that the more plausible explanation to believe is that there was a earlier state of low entropy a macro state of low entropy that the world occupied. And the reason that the current state has the order that it does is because it evolved from some earlier state of lower uh, entropy. And you can reformulate this argument in a Bayesian way. And once you do that, I don't really see a clear distinction between the this kind of justification of the, of, of the uh, past hypothesis and the standard account, and then the kind of uh, justification that you gave, that you called the past conclusion. So okay, could so, you maybe yeah, further right, clarify? So let me, what you're so let me start with some historical comments. Yeah. Um, Maxwell never had a past hypothesis. Don't attribute it to Maxwell. He never had one. Um, it plays no role in the actual argument that Maxwell gave or Boltzmann gave. Right. Maxwell and Boltzmann gave arguments that start from. Uh, from a condition that's not equilibrium, where the, the it, particularly the velocity distribution in the gas is not the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, and give an argument, a you know, an argument that's going to be a typicality argument that depends upon the statistical independence assumption that it will evolve uh, closer and closer to the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Now, if you ask them, but how did you start out away from it? That's not what they're worried about. I mean, they don't make any claim one way or the other about it. They just say, if you're, if you're not in it, you'll evolve toward it, right? Um, now, so as far as the actual argumentation they gave, they didn't invoke any past hypothesis. They just weren't relevant for what they were doing. 
Now you can ask, okay, well, we all agree that at present, we're nowhere near equilibrium. Um, and then you can go on to ask, well, why is that? And Maxwell does mention, or Boltzmann mentions anyway, that this, this uh, argument given not by him, by his assistant, right? That, well, gee, if the universe is infinite in time, uh, which is what everybody thought, right? They thought the, the, the going back to you know antiquity that right. the universe was infinite in time. If it was infinite in time, then you'd have these fluctuations and you get this whole fluctuational story. Now that that's Boltzmann never endorsed that. Um, he just mentions it as a possibility. The other possibility is that no, there's an initial state and there's something special. Of course, Newton would have said God created the initial state, right? And the reason why it was so low entropy was because of what God had in mind, right? Um, um, and, and you're quite right that, that, that uh, much, much later Feynman kind of destroys the fluctuational hypothesis. Right. That just shows that it, it makes the wrong predictions, okay? So we can't accept the fluctuational hypothesis. I mean, I take it that's the situation. Well now, yeah, or it's, it's, it's just a much uh, less plausible explanation to believe. It's still possible, but well, it's yeah, yeah. much I, 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 of less course. plausible it's, it's, than the... It's, yeah. it's possible, yeah. but, it's, you know, as I yeah. say, it's like, yeah. you know, and, and when people get into this and say microdynamics, blah, 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 I say, look, you have two students who handed you um, papers that are, that are letter for letter identical. And if they come to you and you say, well, you know, it could have happened that we just thought about right. the problem in the same way and hit on the same words. And you'd say, yeah, that's possible, but go away. You know, that didn't happen. Right. right. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, merely noting that something is possible is not a very interesting thing to do. And, and that was what the whole no, swinging course. door yeah. thing was. Yes, we understand yeah. that um, given the microdynamics, it's going to be possible that entropy not increase, blah, blah, blah. We grant that, but it's, it's not an interesting possibility for reasons I was trying to articulate. Um, now, the question is, as far as like the way the past hypothesis has been introduced in some modern discussions, it was supposed to be needed to defeat a disastrous retrodiction. What I've been arguing well, is there is no disastrous retrodiction you need to defeat. Right, but, what, sure but, but well, actually, not. actually, I mean, so, so the argument that I gave is a paraphrasing of an argument for uh, the past conclusion that Feynman himself gave. So in the same place where he uh, right F Feynman again. he he, he dismantles the fluctuation hypothesis as a he he he, he compares it to um, a past hypothesis type of explanation. And he says, when you compare these two, clearly the past hypothesis explanation better but, accords with the facts is more natural. So we ought to you believe don't, it. You don't need a comparison. And just logic does it for you, right? I mean, logically either entropy was always lower but, in the past or it was, it was higher in the past. The fluctuational hypothesis no. says it was higher in the past and fluctuated down and, and, and Feynman destroys and, that and if you destroy that then all you're left with is that it was always lower in the past right but, but, so but like he, you're just you know it's just a logical the way that, at that point. no no right but but he's compare he compares this past hypothesis explanation to the fluctuation explanation and then he says look we should we should clearly it's, believe it's not a, the past no it's not a question of explanatory power if you rule out the fluctuation all you're left with is what we call the past hypothesis that's the only thing left. Yeah, if the entropy wasn't higher in the past, then it was always but, lower in the past. Right, but that's but that's how he himself characterizes it in his Feynman lectures as an explanation, a uh, better explanation. And uh, I mean, well, so that's the, how like the modern other you know modern proponents of the Boltzmannian account think of the or justify the past hypothesis. So I guess I'm. Just well, not okay. sure, I, like, well, what's the innovation in your account in terms of justifying the past hypothesis again, um, as I, com I, compared I, to I, these I, more modern accounts of the justifications of the past hypothesis? I, I again, uh, I, I'll just say this one more time. Some people think there is a disastrous retrodiction that needs to be defeated. And that the past hypothesis is brought in to defeat that. 
I don't think there's any such disastrous retrodiction that needs to be defeated. Of course, I think entropy was lower in the past. Everybody thinks entropy was lower in the past. Um, why one calls it a hypothesis, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I'm, I mean, it's, it seems- I think that's a misnomer. That should be- we should Yeah, I think it's a misnomer too. Term. It makes it sound like it's a fundamental posit, which itself, I don't, I don't, I mean, I kind of don't understand. Yeah. But there is, I, look, there is a line of argument that from a logical point of view, if you don't have it, you're gonna be forced into some very bad retrodictions. And all I did was give an argument that, no, you're not forced, you, know, you won't ever get those bad retrodictions. You're just normal Bayesian reasoning, which we all agree with, will give you good retrodictions without invoking right. any extra hypothesis. That's, that's all I was yeah. arguing with. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that argument. It just seems to me that that's like, people have made that argument in the past um, or in a slightly modified form. And so I just wasn't sure if you were saying that this is a new argument. No, or, I, uh, I'm, I'm not making one or claim or another about the history of people discussing this. I was just making a logical point about how this works. That's all. Gotcha. There may very well be other people who pointed this out. I'm, I'm perfectly happy or not. Can I just put a plug? Yes, the, exactly the same thing is in this book or Beyond Chance and Credence, available from Oxford University Press. <laughs> Okay, um, so um, let's take Michael and Lorenzo, and then we will call it a day. So please, Michael, go ahead. Okay. Um, it sounded like, I'm not sure, but it's, it sounded like it was possible with your model with a sm very small probability to decrease the entropy. And sure. my question is, have you thought about what that would possibly have what type of implication does that have on the conservation of energy in terms of, is it now possible that the conservation of energy uh, is violated on any particular trial, but only, but maybe only holds on average? No, or does the, it mean... no, no, I'm sorry. This is no, there, 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 there's no prospect of violating conservation of energy. I mean, if, 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 if there's a fluctuation that reduces entropy, if, if, the, if the glass of, of lukewarm water in front of me just by accident suddenly segregates itself into, into an ice cube and boiling water, which it can do without violating conservation of energy, right? Because when it goes from boiling water and ice cube to tepid, it doesn't violate conservation of energy. If it does that, well, then all of a sudden I can recover a bunch of that energy mechanically using a heat engine, which I couldn't when it was just uh, uniform tepid water. But there's no prospect in any of this of violating conservation of energy. Well, if you have, let's say, hot, if you have, let's say, the Maxwell demon, if you have hot air and cold air separated, and you can generate electricity if you just as the yeah. as the hot air flowed to the cold, and suppose yeah. that's suppose that's simply reversed. I get, and I did. I mean, if I could reverse it and go to a different entropy, then I could generate electricity again. Yeah, but what you're heat, saying is you think heat you engines think are just ways of getting mechanical energy out of thermal energy, but they don't violate the conservation of energy. That's the first law. We're not trying to violate the first law. That's just conservation of energy. Well, so nothing I said anywhere ever suggests that any of this would lead to a violation of the conservation of energy. Right. You haven't, I guess you haven't suggested it. I know you haven't suggested it, but I guess my question is, it's it's not clear to me that there isn't a counterexample once you allow that, where you could somehow generate more mechanical energy. But I have to think about it. Maybe you're right. Sure. There's if, no, if, no if, counter. If everybody agrees if entropy decreases, then this then after the decrease, I can easily recover more mechanical energy out of its thermal energy than I could before the decrease. Everybody agrees okay. about that. And everybody Art. agrees that it is possible for entropy to go down. Everybody agrees about that. That's the, the, that's the bulk of the reversibility objection. And everybody agrees we never see it go down, at least not macroscopically, right? We see it go down microscopically with tiny fluctuations. 
That's well, just why, a situation. We... I haven't said I haven't said anything at all controversial on any of those topics. And of course, if there were some huge downward fluctuation, you would now be able to recover more more of that thermal energy as mechanical energy. But that but this is not something to do with me. This is just this is just common ground. Everybody agrees. Well, where do we see where do we see in microscopically en entropy decreasing? Oh, for, for just just look at Brownian motion. Okay, um, sometimes you're going to kick the particle in a way that, uh, that, that raises its mean kinetic energy above the average or leaves it below the average. I mean, actual, the, you know, once you get small enough and, and fine enough, uh, entropy, if your macro description is fine enough, the entropy is actually fluctuating. Now, I mean, there's a question, this is a question that Feynman addresses with his ratchet and pull argument would there be some way to accumulate all these little fluctuations? And the answer is that he gives is no for, again, uh, uh, for reasons that have to do with typicality. But well, again, yeah, I'm, but I'm not, I'm at... not I, I haven't made a single claim from beginning to end that's about this or that would be different from what anybody would say about it. Right, but if you take quantum mechanics, the uni unitary evolution doesn't change entropy at all and measurement it's my belief only increases entropy. So if you just take the real and the really, I think fundamentally everything's a quant occurring either by unitary evolution or measurement. Okay, wait, 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 wait. It doesn't change entropy at all. It's the same wait. because- it's No, no, you're, no not, now you're mi mixing up two things. There's a thing called the von Neumann entropy that applies to quantum mechanics. It just is not the thermodynamic entropy at all. And the fact that the, if in a unitary evolution, the von Neumann entropy doesn't change, that doesn't mean that the thermodynamic entropy isn't going up, 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 which it typically will be. That's just because they're different things, okay? The, the von Neumann entropy just is not a measure of, 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 uh, of, of, of this, the thermodynamic entropy. Because you can have pure states. I mean, a pure state, a pure state will evolve to a pure state and its von Neumann entropy won't change, but it could be the, a pure state corresponding to, uh, again, uh, 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 ice in hot water evolving to one that corresponds to more or less uniformly tepid water. The thermodynamic entropy is going up and if it's a pure state, the, the von Neumann entropy isn't. So it's just, you, you, there are all these things called entropy because they're defined by some sum of P log P. But, but also the Shannon entropy has nothing to do with thermodynamic entropy. It's also defined by P log P. It's just a different P. And, and, and in, in the case of von Neumann, it's a different gadget that you're sticking into that number. And you can't, it's, it, it's gonna lead to a tremendous amount of confusion if you think that what holds of one of these entropies holds of the others, because they're very different. Okay, so you're basically talking, you're not talking about the either the von Neumann or the Shannon, you're mainly talking about just uh, the, the the classical thermodynamic entropy. Yeah, I'm talking about trying to recover thermo classical thermodynamic entropy in a statistical mechanical setting. That's what okay. I'm All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, very last question from Lorenzo. Please go ahead, Lorenzo. Uh, thanks. Very nice. Uh, uh, first of all, let me say I'm not sure I should ask this question because it's late. So. Tim, if, if it's okay for you. It's fine by me, it's early here. Okay, good, good. <laughs> it's, it's okay, only so, one o'clock. So, yeah, okay. No, it's not so early here. Anyway, uh, um, I'm not sure I understand your claim that uh, about the past, uh, past hypothesis because the past hypothesis clearly, typically is, necessary when when you have a completely deterministic dynamics where whereas in your case you don't because you have this uh, you have uh, probabilities that come come in from two places on one side you have this uh, drinking of later water which causes the the person to forget and on the other side you have this thing that the uh, doors are randomly placed so you don't know where they go so so probably it is coming in two different places in your argument whereas okay so uh, so let me look i maybe i shouldn't have put this thing about leafy into because it's not playing any uh let me just make a comment about that look, nothing i've said 
again, presu presumes anything about the, the, the micro dynamics. It could perfectly well be deterministic. Bell makes a, a, a lovely comment in his paper on free variables and, and local causality. When he talks about what we think of as, as randomizing machines, right? Which you could be throwing dice. Okay, maybe it's deterministic, fine. You could be randomizing by using the parity of the digits of pi. That's sure deterministic, right? That's as deterministic as anything get is to use the, the parity of digits of pi starting in the millionth place, okay? But that's a perfectly good pseudo random number generator, a, a randomizing machine. Sure. The sense of randomness here has to do with statistical independence. It doesn't have to do with dynamics. And, and, and the thing about, and, and the thing that Bell says is, you know, the miracle of statistical mechanics is how you see this very fine dependence on initial conditions serves as a forgetting machine. I mean, those are his words. He's not saying the dynamics isn't deterministic. He's just saying um, randomizers have the effect of making things statistically independent from other things. And typically that's by deterministic means. Right. No, no, I agree with that. I mean, what, what you're pointing out is basically that in order to have entropy, you, you need some coarse graining, so you have to somehow... For, sure, okay. for the Boltzmann that, entropy, that, it, it depends that's on this fine. partition, right? This is all relative right. to a partition of phase. Exactly. You, you need some coarse graining, otherwise... Yeah, yeah, sure. I agree with that, but I can easily uh, recast your argument using... Uh, uh, de uh, deterministic dynamics and you won't get uh, the features that you need. For example, take a box and uh, and, and drill like a uh, hundred thousand holes on one side and one hole on the other side. Mm -hmm. Now if you if the box is the holes on the, on the side of the box and you pour water in, of course the water flows out on the side where you have 100,000 holes. But if you put the box upright and the 100,000 holes are on the top, the water flows down the single hole on the bottom, you see? And, it, and you don't get that's, the argument you want. That's because of gravity. Sure, but I don't of course. That, that's because of gravity. So we, we, yeah, when of course, we do this, it's like, gravity. That, that's, when we talk that's about ideal gases, ideal gases are, there evolution. is no gravity. I mean, you can deal, you can deal with gravity statistical and mechanical. No, no, that's just, uh, gravity is, is not essential to the point I was making. The, the point I was making is that if you forego the, the randomness, and you put some uh, some deterministic law like gravity, for example, or you can think of anything else. The argument, the feature you want for your argument, just fail. But it, again, Maxwell's and Boltzmann's original arguments presupposed a perfectly deterministic microphysics, sure. and they used statistical independence assumptions. So when you say when you say assuming determinism spoils the argument, it doesn't. It didn't then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, something may spoil the argument if you put in forces or this or that. There might be things that spoil the argument, but determinism by itself doesn't. All the original, all the original arguments of Maxwell and Boltzmann. No, no, okay, I, I agree with that. But but I was talking about your argument about the doors. I mean, the the doors or holes or whatever. Your argument, if if you know where the the doors lead and you can easily find a, uh, a way to, to go opposite. To sure, the, if you, sure, if you know, and somebody's yeah, guiding sure. you, but we're talking right, about exactly. systems where nobody knows anything and nobody's guiding anything. So I, I don't understand, of course, if, if, if someone with perfect knowledge of this system, um, perfect knowledge of who they are and where they are in the entire system, they can always decide to walk through a door that gets them to a better place. Sure, but th th that's, there's nothing corresponding to that in nature here. So why would you worry about that situation? Well, I just pointed you to you an example in which there is something corresponding to your nature. If you have gravity, for example, that pulls you in a certain direction. I mean, you can easily find counterexamples to, 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 to the point. But again, I mean, your, your claim was that it was the fact that the micro microdynamics was deterministic right, was leading, exactly. but that's not what's leading to it. It's you're, you're, 
postulating very specific features of the dynamics, which if I were dealing with gravity, I'd have to bring gravity into the analysis, right? I mean, of course I don't have gravity in the, I'm just not relevant for what I'm doing. I wasn't no. dealing with a system where I'm worried about gravitational effects. They actually turned out to be very tricky as I found out to, to, to take account of gravitational effects actually, even statistical mechanically. I'm, um, I mean, it's hard. It's really hard to do, quite honestly. Um, right, for example, to... black holes become hotter when... Uh... No, 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 I, 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 what I have in mind, just by the way, very, very simple question. Take, take a, 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 a closed cylinder of gas, in a gravitational field, right, on Earth, like a really tall one. And we know that whereas a, an ideal gas, it'll equilibrate with constant pressure, right, and constant density, that if we have this silo of gas, it won't. There'll be more pressure and more density at the bottom and at the top. Question, will there also be a temperature gradient, right? Will, will the temperature, when, when it comes to equilibrium, sure. will the temperature be constant? It, I don't know the, I've been working on that and working on that and it's well, not I mean, obvious. Have you ever been to the mountains? It's colder there. So, so that, of course that's Yeah, that's answer. not a silo. That's not a silo, a closed silo of gas. Well, I mean, why not? I mean, but, Because there, there's no silo there. I, I'm talking about something coming to thermal equilibrium in a, in a, you know, with reflective boundaries. It just, you'd think it would be an easy thing to analyze. It's actually quite difficult. Um, okay. I still don't know what the answer is. Right. I know experts who don't know what the answer is. So. Right. Okay. <laughs>